You are in for a very special treat today. One of the most important artists alive today, and I know he's going to blush about this, but please welcome Graydon Parrish. Hi, Graydon. Hello, Eric. How are you? So what's that behind you? I'm, I'm just curious. Uh, that is my uh, slightly over life size painting of Carmen del Orifice. She's a, a incredibly interesting person. Has been a model all her life, and now she's going to be ninety, and she still is modeling for uh, Vogue, and and she's in Target and uh, Sephora. Um, she's a really fascinating person who's known a lot of artists. Wonderful. And uh, well, we're going to talk a lot about um, your art today. I just for everybody's benefit, I want to show what may be your most famous painting. Uh, yeah. This painting uh, is how many feet long would, would you say that is? 18. 18 feet long and what, about six or seven feet tall? Yeah, a little over seven and a half, I think. Yeah. That's all I remember. Yeah, and, and how long did it take you to paint that? I'm just curious. I know you did hundreds of studies. Well, you know, it was the first big uh, painting I had done on that scale, and it took me over, under four years, maybe a little three and a half, something like that. It, I painted the whole thing in uh, grisaille first before I painted it in color. Um, the roses, for example, I had to import regularly uh, from California. It was an ordeal. It's just a lot. And, and it was only me. I had no assistance. So probably that's why it took so long. Well, that's the, that's the benefit of youth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to learn a, about your painting today, but you also are going to do something very special for us. What are you going to do? Well, in uh, anticipation of my upcoming participation in uh, Realism Live, the big worldwide expo online, I am going to copy a Bouguereau head study. Um, I have studied Bouguereau a long time, and uh, I'm, but I've updated it with uh, Munsell. So we're going to be able to analyze his colors exactly. But right now I'm just going to do a site size drawing in preparation for the class. I'm starting out in charcoal and then Bouguereau, he would ink the drawing later or go over it with paint. So we'll do that as well uh, in the expo coming up. So oh, outstanding. All right. So we'll be back in just a minute. So folks, we got Graydon Parrish. Uh, what a monumental day. I mean, this, this is a very special artist. Uh, he's a very close friend of mine. He happens to live in the same town that I live in part of the year and uh, is one of the most important artists alive today and, and his, is probably the world's leading expert on color. And you will talk a little bit about the color theory and the Munsell system and what he's developed as a result of that as well. So we'll be back with him in just a second in Austin, Texas. And uh, we had an opportunity to get to know each other when I moved to Austin, probably about 11 years ago. And I had the rare opportunity to, uh, to study with Graydon for about six or eight months, I believe. And it was one of the best six or eight months I ever had. Well, that's nice. I was also thinking about the, so the portrait thing. And it was the greatest, you know, if you were a wealthy person, the, your uh, love interest might send you a portrait just to see what they were. So it's kind of the original Photoshop as well. Artists had a, had a task to make you look as good as you can so that the person wanted to marry you at a distance. So yeah, portraits of friends, family, yourself, and other artists. I'm all have, for that. Have you done self-portraits? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've done three. You have? Uh, one, is, uh, uh, one was for Michael Huffington in his, uh, in his uh, museum at his alma mater. So it was, it was fun. I yeah. like it. Yeah, I've been working on one. I started working on one during COVID, and it's a big one. It's, you know, three or four feet high, and um, uh, I, I'm kind of regretting going that large, but it's been a great experience, and, and I've been suffering a lot, but I haven't been able to work on it since I came up to the lake here. So It's good suffering. Good. It's character building, Eric. Character yes, building. it is. Character building, suffering. So, Graydon, uh, before we get into what you're going to teach today, let, tell us a little bit about your background and career, because you have become, as I said, one of the premier artists uh, in the world today, uh, certainly, uh, especially in the in the classical realism area. I'm, I know that's not a term we like. I'm not sure what the term is. I think you have a term that you use, which is what? Well, we were starting to call ourselves post-contemporary artists. Post-contemporary artists. That's well, the name. Tongue in cheek. It's only because we all know that we're contemporary because I'm I'm still alive, 
and but we don't paint in a contemporary style. What everybody thinks of is generally uh, insulation or or uh, postmodernism. So we just thought it'd be funny to they're contemporary, so we're post contemporary, and you know these kind of names stick sometimes and they don't. I'm not a fan of classical realism because classicism is its distinct uh, style, and realism is its distinct style. I'm it's a maybe a catch-all for what we're doing, but I'm not sure it's um, my favorite, but I've gone with it before. So I, it's, it's not a, it doesn't bother me wholly, but I, a little bit. Well, I get that. And, and this has been the hard thing is to find the right term that sticks right. that, that really describes it because there, there are people who are doing classicism, but they're doing it in a contemporary form yeah. wow. there. You know, the goal here is not to repeat, uh, you know, 1780, the idea is to create something that is reflective of our generation today, but we are using the techniques that were passed down from hundreds of years, which is not necessarily the case with a lot of other forms of art. No, there was a conscious uh, effort, and then now I'm probably not conscious to uh, obliterate classicism and realism for some reason at the time. I mean, it's, you know, people wore parachute pants in the, you know, 80s, so Hopefully that won't come back either. Um, it's, um, I just think it's being inspired and learning from the past. And I, I'm not a person who wants to imitate uh, where it's indistinguishable from what's gone on before, but I have no problem, you know, relishing all the great art that came before me. And um, I am an art history junkie. So, you know, anything works and I, I have taste from Botticelli to uh, uh, Albert Glaze, the Cubist, and I just like painting classes classically because, you know, what what scratches your brain, Eric? You know, you do too. You love to get out there and paint, and there's something that is really satisfying to study nature. Do you ever um, get into experimental mode? I mean, you, you you paint in a very traditional form, but do you ever have this this desire to just try something different? Do you ever play with paint and, and do those kinds of things? Or do you stay very disciplined to what you've learned? I have a, I have a closet self, you know, but you might not ever see that. Um, but at the same time, it's just, I just love classical. I love beauty. I love nature. I like craft. I like the intellect, it, you know, color theory, because it really is interesting. And it just, classical art gives me a bar to a strive for. Um, I don't know how I'm going to evolve. The, I did a portrait of Paul Giamatti that I left unfinished in the background, and it was it was an experiment. And uh, and so yeah, I do, uh, but I don't do it in a. Um, I try to not do it in a self conscious way. Meaning, I'm not saying I'm going out and doing this because someone else did it. I just kind of go with the image. I don't know if that makes sense to you, but. Yeah. Uh, it's making sense to me at this point. <laughs> you also wrote a very important book. I'm going to show an image of that book now. Uh, it's a little fuzzy, but uh, this is a book that you put on with Jerry Ackerman, uh, the Barg book, which is, you want to tell people a little bit about the history of the Barg drawing course? Yeah, they had a lot of different drawing uh, courses and uh, at the past. It's one by Julian. He, it was it's very beautiful. But when you read the documentation in the 19th century, they thought it, it provided bad taste. Now, that's a very interesting uh, topic in the 19th century because, you know, we think today that, you know, your personal taste is sacrosanct. But they didn't believe that in the 19th century. They thought there was a good balance. And what they would ask themselves is what is the most true and what is the most beautiful and how do I portray both at the same time? And that is a very interesting question, in my opinion, because truth can be ugly, right? And beauty can be used as a uh, as propaganda. So they were trying to measure those two things and they yoked them in kind of a, a, a syzygy with this sort of truth and beauty being important. And that's what they saw in Barg. Barg's, Barg, Barg answered a problem, uh, this sort of super uh, uh, florid kind of drawing. And he got something that was a lot more truthful in their opinion. And that's why they hired him. And they hired him to be the lithographer. At first, a lot of the cast drawings were done by other people uh, like Jerome, Le Comte Nui. And then Bard was the lithographer because he did, um, um, he was, he had won many, many, many medals for that at the salon. So that is a little bit the history. They didn't think the other manuals were tasteful. 
they, they answered this call. Goupil is the one that published it. And Barg, again, was a lithographer. And, and about that time, after, around when he did the course, he started to paint brilliantly. So I think the Barg course and his experience in that probably helped. Well, and the Barg course is being used in pretty much all the ateliers today. Can you tell us a little bit about the traditional atelier method of teaching? Well, so you're going to laugh a little bit because the Barg uh, book was intended for um, not uh, college students and not not high school students, but the equivalent of sort of a middle school student. So they were meant to start very, very young. Really? Oh, so, yeah. When you read that, um, they were meant they in the 19th century, they thought the first steps were copying from the flat. So they would copy from these books, these instruction books, as well as prints and drawing. So that was the first step in that in that uh, area. They actually kind of started being uh, sold on subscription basis and and many, many, many people subscribe to that. They had copy. They had copies in Iceland. There's, of course, at the Victorian Albert Museum and then at the Goupil Museum. Um, they had stashes of them that were sold at the Dahesh when they did the show. It It is an atelier method, but it's not something that um, it, once you got to the Ecole de Beaux-Arts and you were in a Cabanel studio, you wouldn't be copying Barg like you'd be doing casts. So it was copying. No, you would have done the Barg before you got there to, yeah. to pass the entry exam. Yes, yes, that sort of thing. And it was still a self-help. Of course, you know, Van Gogh uh, copied it, uh, Picasso, um, anybody who was looking for classical drawing. And when I teach it, uh, that is one of the things that makes the most difference for people's drawing skills. And don't ever think you don't need to draw. If you're going to paint well, you need to draw well. It is not something that you can trace away. Drawing needs to be understood. Well, uh, it, this has been one of the most helpful things for me. I don't get a lot of time, but I I put the Barg drawings on my iPad. Oh, wow. And then, I, and then I, I'll set up my iPad when I'm on an airplane seat, and I'll copy them uh, on a sketch pad in my airplane seat. And It, it helps me with that hand-eye coordination. Uh, and, and I find myself at least once or twice a year now copying Barg drawings, even still, because I'm, I'm not a good draftsman trying to get better. And I think it's, it's really a great discipline. Yeah, it's great. And then the other thing that um, people didn't quite understand today is that it really was trying to teach taste. And again, we talked about taste. It was something that was learnable. It was measured. So, you know, when you read critiques of painters coming from, uh, Rome, when they were to pre to Rome, and they were sending their uh, their envoi back to Paris to be criticized, they would say stuff like, you know, uh, again, too too much detail, too uh, too mannerous. Didn't the figure wasn't Apollo ish enough, whatever that means. But it was they were really trying to dissect what something that wasn't too. Uh, over the top or too restrained. There was this middle ground that they were striving for. And it really well, had to do with it. It's a fine line, isn't it? Because, yeah. it, you know, you, you can go too far and then it feels, what's the term, chocolate box. Yes. Right? It, it feels a little bit too, that's the term Peter uses anyway, Peter Trippi, uh, but it, it feels a little too sweet or a little too overdone or a little too perfect. It's coy, right? Yeah, I agree with you. And that is just that fine line. and. And you know, my favorite, one of my favorite artists, of course, is Bouguereau. I love the way he paints, but he does occasionally kind of slip into that. You're like, oh, Bouguereau, why'd you do that? Now, I don't think people were as cynical as we are today back then, but but still, I, that kind of overness. And so his paintings that I prefer are the paintings where there's some restraint. Well, there, that overness is probably what caused the rebellion that he faced um, in the in the school. Yeah. Yeah, it so did. you you had uh, you had a pretty rich history in terms of Bouguereau and having access to the Bouguereau notes and so on. Tell us briefly about that. Well, I had a passion for him in my early twenties, and I actually met Fred Ross and and told him I loved Bouguereau and showed him all the notes that I'd taken. And he said, you know, I Jerry Ackerman needs an assistant, and so I Jerry called me and we talked. And I speak some French much better before than. When I moved to Texas, you know, it's not not so good. Texas accent in that. I know. So I uh, I did that, and so I flew out, and I would stay with Jerry Ackerman for about ten years, uh, working on various projects. 
it'd go out for a month or two. We would, and we started with Bouguereau. And so I had access to all of Mark Stephen Walker's notes, which he had accumulated when he was doing the original catalog, Raisonnet, which was uh, the, the show that was at the Hartford Athenaeum and, uh, and, and, and in Paris. Fascinating. I want to show a couple of pieces of your work and, and just give me a, a, a quick comment or two. Tell me about this piece. Well, this was actually, um, you know, I still look at it and it, it, it was my first big attempt at a multiple figure painting. And I, I learned a lot, you know, with it. Do I like looking at it now? No, but I did actually, it was a lot of effort to try to do something like that. And it, it was not, you know, it's nice of people because a little bit before this, you know, Damien Hirst revival, this was on several covers of magazines and in the New York art world. And so it, I, my thoughts at the time was that, boy, you know, realism is coming back. Uh, but this was a, 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 an allegory to uh, people who died young in, at, in AIDS, uh, uh, which was still prevalent. And that was before they had any kind of treatment. Right. And, and then tell us a, a little bit more about this painting. Uh, this painting was actually, after 9-11, was commissioned by the New Britain Museum of, of American Art. Douglas Highland was the director at the time, and he visited me. And he was going to buy something small. And then and I said, well, you know, I have this 9-11 painting in my mind. What do you think? And he was very enthusiastic. So I proposed this idea uh, for the museum, and they went with it. And so I was very lucky to have it. It's only been in that museum uh, since I painted it. And uh, it was, it's an allegory of 9-11. It really talks about uh, how people are blind to the future. Uh, they wake up, but yet somehow we can't pass wisdom on to our uh, offspring, our children, or future generations that have to kind of make the mistake again. And you see that, those cycles in, in the history of, of humanity where you'd think that they, people would learn a lesson from this tragic event. And unfortunately, uh, many don't. So that, that was the idea of the painting, sort of an ages of man. There's a lot of allegorical overlaps uh, with it as well. And uh, if I remember correctly, one of the models was a twin brother of another who died in the, in the uh, Twin Towers. Is that correct? Am I getting that wrong? Oh, it's fine, yeah. It was very interesting uh, that way. Um, the model, I, you know, I, I didn't I let go of him up. I just always stories about, you know, in public sees the paintings, Eric, you know, they think one way, the artists think, and uh, they forget all of the, uh, all the things that probably went home behind the scenes. So you see these Dutch paintings with the dog and uh, people are eating, and I'm sure the dog didn't behave and people got thirsty and they left. And like any model, they have to scratch their backs. And I had all of that with this painting. So it was a struggle to uh, get it done. But like a like your PhD thesis, a lot of people say that that's when they really learn to write. Uh, after I did, I to really had a pain. Hmm. Excellent. Okay, I'm going to show uh, two or three quick portraits that you've okay. done. Yeah. These almost look like they're done on porcelain. They have that that glow. Oh, thank you. That's uh, something I'm going to teach with the upcoming uh, Bouguereau Munsell uh, discussion that we're going to have at Realism Live. It's really about low chroma, and it's astounding how much color you can get with chromas between one and three. For example, that zero is neutral, so one is just one step above, and three is about the average of human flesh. And Bouguereau paints about a two, so the, all of that sort of uh, light skin is very, very low in chroma. Hmm. There's another. Yeah. And another. Right. Well, listen, I don't want to dip into your time here for drawing. I'm going to uh, drop off the screen and turn it over to you, and you can take over and show us what, what you want to teach today. Okay. Can I just uh, preface that really quickly? Yes. Okay. So what happened, Bouguereau's technique in general wa were to do uh, studies, uh, thumbnails, then uh, studies of in drawing, and, and then detailed, and then head studies in oil. And this is what I really love, the unfinished look of his head studies. Um, I actually love unfinished works of art as a painter. Um, and those are things that I'd like to collect. Even I even collect them from living artists so I can see uh, this, the way they painted. Uh, and then he, after that, he would make a cartoon, which would be a large uh, drawing the same size as the painting and then transfer it. So I'm not sure actually how he, what he did to draw these head studies in. 
there's no evidence that I've seen. There are there are head studies with little pencil drawings around, so you might have drawn it in pencil. I'm drawing it in vine charcoal so that I can move things around a little bit. And after that, I will make it permanent by painting the outline. Now, I'm not going to be able to paint the outline today or finish the drawing, but I just want to show you how I do it. I also uh, learned to work in site size. Now, I don't think Bouguereau did that. I do it because I can be my own teacher, and it's a way I can step back and compare uh, A to A, one to one, and really get it, um, as opposed to not using site size and then having it in a different plane or perspective than what I'm seeing. So I'm not saying that Bougro used side size. I'm not saying he used Munsell, but both of those techniques can be used to understand what he did. So uh, that's how I'm going to approach it. All right. And we do have people who will not understand terms like site size. So as you're talking about some of these terms, explain them if you would, because we have uh, all levels of people watching from beginners to experienced. Yeah, and I do that. And Eric, um, if you still have your voice and not the video, uh, just pipe in and ask some questions if I'm missing anything, because sometimes I forget that people, where people start out, and it's just my fault. I'm try I'll try to be as clear as possible. All right, terrific. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to move it to my viewing spot. Right back. <laughs> Well, we have uh, no, no image. I hope that's about to be corrected. <laughs> I put the video on off so that I can uh, move my uh, computer to my spot. I'll re replug oh, it okay. in. okay. All right. Okay. Yes. All right. I, just, I see what's happening. I just want you to see all my uh, secrets in my studio, all those dead animals and, and corpses and skeletons. So uh, that's why I'm turning it off. And please, I'm teasing. Don't call the police. He's a, a man, a man of international mystery. I am, yeah. I have to say, nobody likes an artist that is completely transparent. You know, I've, I've, uh, I, I should tell a tale on you. And, and, and um, Annie Sweat and I were talking one day, and uh, we, we were both talking about. She studied under you for a while, and I studied under you for a while, and we of course see you socially from time to time. And she said, you know. Graydon has never allowed me into his studio. I said, no, me neither. I said, there must be dead bodies in there. So uh -huh. now, now we know the mystery. Yeah, well, you know, uh, among other things. <laughs> uh, hold on one right. second. I'm putting this in again uh, uh, real quick. Uh, so All right. It works, and then okay. we will start. Okay, everybody who's watching, our guest is Graydon Parrish. And I'll just put one of his images on the screen again so that you can see this until he comes back on. So you have something to see. And uh, this is absolutely phenomenal. I saw this in person. All right, here he is. He's back. Okay. Oops, it fell out again. Hold on one second. Um, I, I told Eric that I'm just getting used to technology and uh, it usually backfires on me because I'm so grounded in the, you know, in the past in some ways. But now I'm getting very good at it. Like so, seven so this painting that you're going to be uh, doing a drawing from, uh, tell us about that. Okay, this is uh, a, a Bouguereau here, head study. This is an actual Bouguereau. Uh-huh. Oh. Yeah, this was a study for his uh, one painting that was in uh, uh, Buenos Aires, I believe, and it was destroyed. So all this left for this painting. It was a, a painting of a lot of women, and there was Cupid. It was kind of like the admiration which is in San Antonio Museum of Art. But this particular painting uh, was not uh, preserved. Now this head study, interesting enough, I'll put this right here, was also reused in a painting. So Bouguereau would do these head studies and then sometimes reuse them in other paintings. And this was one of his most popular models at the time. Uh, I don't remember her name, but, uh, but this is an actual Bouguereau. And I've got right here, and it's a little bit different color, but when I measured the value on the Bouguereau here, it was a value six in Munsell terms. So I, in the painting here, that that the uh, that I on the canvas, I just quickly put a six value neutral. Now the color here is different. A lot of that's from the varnish that has aged a little bit, so it's a little bit more yellow. But yeah. Bouguereau would trans, he would use a lot of like sixes and sevens. So when you're when you have a grayscale, and you have something related to Munsell. Think about six and seven. seven six and seven are average uh, values for uh, Caucasian flesh. Most people are between a three and a seven 
with, and I've never seen anybody in an eight, there may be somebody at a two. I measure a lot of different complexions and that is something that uh, I have noticed. So in this case, Bouguereau has a, is painted on a six value ground, something low in chroma. All right. And what kind of a canvas are you painting on? Is it a board, a canvas? What? This is a canvas. Um, this is a nod to uh, Virgil Elliott in that I am not Virgil painting on linen or cotton. I am painting on polyester. Now, Bouguereau would have painted on linen. Polyester is something that conservators ad advise right now because it's not hygroscopic, meaning that it is, uh, uh, is it hygroscopic or hygro. Anyway, so that term, race that, that I said it wrong. But anyway, it, it reacts less to the environment and the humidity. So people might have had um, problems with linen sagging and then it tightens up in a different atmosphere. Uh, this doesn't sag at all. I've never had this droop sag or anything and it's very smooth without any of the knots that linen has in it. So what I've done here is I have got a, a polyester canvas and I have primed it with lead white. Lead white would be something that Bouguereau would have primed it with. He may have actually, a lot of these canvases he used were bought. They had manufacturers at the time. This is 18 by 15 here, inches. That is what all of his head studies are on that I've seen. All of them are on the same size. And then I had lead white, and then I toned at the six value ground with um, a neutral. Mm -hmm. so that's about it. It's a little bit uh, spotty, spotty than I like, but um, anyway, we just go for it. We'll cover it up. Excellent. Okay. Okay. Uh, right. Do you have any questions? Do you, are you able to field questions from the viewers? Or uh, I am, and I will read them as they come in. But uh, I'd say you got about 20, 25 minutes, so I want to make sure you can get started on this. Um, uh, people are asking, where do you get polyester material? Uh, Art Fix is one. Okay. And there, another one is uh, Rose Brand. It is a theatrical uh, supply house. And they have very good uh, muslin. And, I mean, and then there is um, a, another brand I like called Caravaggio Brand. And it has a very nice, very stretchable uh, material. And, you know, you can almost stretch it by hand without pliers. Uh, so that's, that's the three places I get. I can email you those, Eric, and you can get them out to people if you'd like to. Uh, sure. Some of these links. Uh, and well, I'll tell you, you, somebody will put them in the comments, I'm sure. Okay. Yeah, we can do right. that. Um, okay, so I'm going to start. Now, everybody, I am using the site size method, meaning that my painting here is, is basically the same size as this. I was unable to get it. Ideally, the canvas and your image would be the same height. So I can't, me people measure, in the Bard book, I show you how to measure with a string across, uh, meaning that that would be the top of the image and the bottom of the image. You could, you could draw a line from this canvas to here, but the idea is to get this a pretty much a one-on-one -on -one experience. Um, and so in order to do that, I am now using, let me show you, uh, on one second. The thing about me is that when I start painting, my brain turns off and I can. <laughs> this is the beginning. Uh, yeah. Great. It starts now. Okay. Let me. I just had this, Eric, and I was looking for. Aha, there we go. There's one. Okay. We got our charcoal. And. Uh, one other thing here. There we go. All right. So what I'm doing right now is I'm using a knitting needle here for my okay. side size of work. It means that if when I hold out the, the needle here, I can measure across. So and I'm you keep your arm straight when you hold it out? Yeah, Eric, it has to be locked. Okay. So you want to keep that out. And this is and this needs to be so you have to just take into consideration that it is not uh, tilted one way or another. So you just look at it and keep it plumb. And your image also has to be straight up and down. Yes. So yeah. using a little bit of a, a, a tiny bit of a, a, they have these really tiny levelers, you know, small levelers, just put it on top of the painting. You want your, the painting that you're copying or the object or your canvas, if you're working from direct observation, uh, to be uh, at, at parallel to the, you know, it, to be plumb, meaning uh, it's uh, parallel and perpendicular and not it to any one side. 
And am I correct that you have to step back about two and a half feet or two and a half times the size of the canvas? Yes, what you want to do is back up enough so you can see the canvas and your painting when you kind of glance back and forth. You don't want to have your nose up in this because when I do that, I can't, um, I can't uh, discern the angles right there. Right. And important. So I, you'd back up about, about uh, Paul Ingbretson is one of a great authority. We have in the Bard book another, and there's a Darren Roussard who has a site size blog, and they will go into detail about that. So I, okay. I highly recommend them as right. scholars on this. I back up, um, so I'm going back to my, my point. I, I, I keep the same point uh, when I'm judging my thing. So I'm going back, I would say that's um, about four, four feet from the canvas. All right. And, okay. and I, I know when I do it, I put a piece of tape on the ground so my toes are always in the same place. You're great. I have, I make my students put their whole foot around a tape so that they don't move. <laughs> It's a That's classic good. way to pay. It's very logical. It yeah. has a lot to do with uh, the Durer grid. Even though we're not putting a grid on it, it means that if you see those old images of Durer, he's looking through an, a device that's keeping his head very straight and in the same perspective. Right. So, well, that's you can uh, look that up. It is tried and true. I'm a big advocate for measuring. I measure everything, and I measure it by eye, and then I check myself because as I've studied color. I've noticed that in drawing that there's a lot of optical illusions that happen. So we will, it's like when we see one color next to another and we think it's all together, we see a straight line next to a slightly straight line. We might think that there is more of a contrast in angles than they really are. Yeah. So uh, I am a big advocate. It's, uh, it's a debate if you don't have to, but for me, I love to know what's precise. Okay, so we're going to let you get started because I don't want to okay. burn your time. You're not. We're working. I'm good. All right. Everybody can look up site size and learn more about it. Okay. So this is, there's a little bit too much glare on this. I'm going to move my light back just a bit. Look at the canvas. Oh, oh, yeah, that's better. I want you to be able to see it. So I uh, will get closer on top there, and you can see that. I'm backing away when I'm making measurements. Um, again, I'm going to measure... Uh, the top and the bottom. And then I have um, I have soft vine charcoal in this case. I like dealing with soft vine charcoal when I'm drawing it's to start because I can move things around. Like right. I know, but perhaps, but hell, it doesn't happen ever. So I am going to uh, be able to erase. It's one of my good friends. So, and, and then I have a pencil sharpener here. And what I do to keep it very sharp is I just spin it in the pencil sharpener and, um, and it makes a good point. All right. That's how I do it. They are lots of, you know, the best ones are the ones that contain the charcoal, uh, but this one works. It's just spinning. Um, I don't know if people can see. That's a pretty sharp yep. point. Yeah. Um, okay. It doesn't have to be perfectly sharp in the beginning uh, because we're doing approximates. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So the first thing I'm going to do is get the top the, of the image and the bottom. I'm going to find the top here, which is the top of her hair. And I'm going to, this is a little bit of a bust, you know, like a classical bust. I'm going to find this point right there. Okay. Okay. So we're going to do that pretty quickly. So I'm getting back now. Oh, and the other thing that I told completely insist my students have is a mirror. This tells you everything about, this is a good friend because it, again, like sight size, it kind of acts like a critic. And when you're seeing things, you think you've got it right. If you turn it in reverse, I look at it like this, or I look at it like this, up and down, okay? Those are two ways that I do to check my drawing, and I check right. it constantly. It's, there's, you know, there's a romantic notion that, uh, that art should just be spontaneous and everybody should just get it, and it's, you know, John Singer, Sargent, Van Gogh, all that stuff. Most 19th century artists were very deliberate in their painting practice, so they put the right color where it was gonna be and didn't fuss around with you know, strokes and all that kind of stuff. So not that you can't do that, but I don't do it, right? Okay. All right, so I'm getting back and I'm looking at it. I'm gonna look at this and make my first guess mark and I'm going to make it here. So that tells me that that right there is the uh, top of the uh, image. Can you see my charcoal mark? Yeah, we see it. Okay, so we're gonna do that and then I'm gonna look at it again. I'm gonna get back and make a guess. So. It's all these beginning um, uh, copies are just um, 
we know that this point is right because like algebra, you can pick one point that is correct and just decide on it. I still wanted to have the relative uh, height is this here. So I'm guessing that uh, my mark is about, that's about there. So I'm going to get back here and I'm gonna look at it back and forth. I'm taking a little measurement of the height of the Bouguereau. And then I'm bringing it over to my, my uh, drawing and I'm gonna guess that it is So these are my two points. These keep the. Uh, Those are your boundaries. These are my boundaries. So you see the top and the bottom. There are the boundaries. And everything in, if you can guess, is going to be within the, those two. Now, this might end up a little bit smaller because my canvas is a little in front of the painting. If your canvas is in front of the painting, it'll be smaller than the actual object. If the canvas is behind the painting, your drawing is going to be a bit larger. If it's right in line with your painting and side size, is going to be the same size. So you can decide what you want to do with that. And they are really good reproductions of Bougaros out there. And so I would, you know, just get the best one you can from a poster and practice. Uh, we want to be like you and own our own Bougaros. Yeah, do your own Bougaros. And also I will help you with the color. So if you say, well, I can't mix the color. I can mix any color on any painting ever. I, it took a long time, but now I, I can do that. And so it's not a problem for All me right. to help people figure out these complicated mixtures. All right, so what you want to do then is you've got that, and you're going to want to guess, again, what the side right and side left is. So I'm going to look at this back and take a measurement. So I'm going back to my point, about four feet away, standing between the two. And you always want to look about three times more than you make a mark. So you want to look at the image and go back and forth with your eyes. Um, I think it's Jeremy Lipking that is really insists on that too. He's, he's a brilliant painter. And he likes to uh, uh, study what he's doing uh, carefully. And then he'll go and I'll say, okay, I'm gonna guess that maybe this right here is gonna be my boundary on the right side, okay? Mm -hmm. Then I go back and look and I'm gonna say, okay, what is the boundary on uh, the left side? And I'm gonna choose the side of the face here rather than the little uh, incidental right. pearl. That's very beautiful, but this is what's gonna get the likeness. And that's just a flourish right there. Um, and so I'm not as worried about copying that to the same fidelity. So I'm sharpening my pencil, my charcoal again. And I'm looking here at the side right. I look at the top and I come back. And I'm going to put the side here. Now, what I'm going to recommend that you do is that you just, you, you just get going and, and move it because we're going to be done in 15 minutes and, and you're going to be out of time. Oh, damn. So, well, yeah. I, I will keep doing it. I won't comment. Um, just I will yeah. keep drawing and you watch me for the next 15 yeah, And I'll do play by play. How about okay. that? Thank you, All Eric. Right. Appreciate it. All right. All right. Okay. So he's putting in the chin mark. Now he's putting in the top of the hair. Top of the eyebrow or top of the hair? Uh, this is the hairline right here. Okay. I'm making this distance here and I've got this distance there. Okay, now I'm going to. Getting those angles is, is, I find is always tough. The angle, slight angle of the eyebrows. Yes. You always want to make your, your judgments back from, from the side. All right, that's good. So I'm, I'm just guessing we may have to go a little longer today. That's fine. I'm here. Um, I only have a meeting with the Pope about 2.30, so yeah. we're good. Okay. Well, that, that's because I have a meeting at 1.30. Okay, good. So we're both busy yeah. at that. Okay. Yeah. Good. Same Pope. 
<laughs> I love it. This is what I went through when I'm, I'm, I'm not going to ask you to comment. I'm just play by play. Uh, when uh, I had my portrait painted by Adrian Gottlieb, he spent a tremendous amount of time getting the measurements right in the beginning. And boy, did it pay off. Yeah, he's a, he's a brilliant painter. You got your portrait painted done by him. I mean, yep. he's lucky. But... All right. So keep, let's paint, see. keep drawing, Graydon. I got to keep you. Keep you on task here. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, don't be sorry. We just, I, w I know that some people don't have a lot of time. So what I'm gonna do for everyone's benefit, just because I know we wanna see this develop, um, I will keep this going after our one hour mark, but it will sign off on YouTube. So if you're watching on YouTube, you can uh, move over to Facebook, or you can move over to Facebook for the replay. I think also Instagram will knock off at one hour. So you can go over to Facebook and we'll try to not go too much longer, but we'll see how long it takes to develop. You're just tuning in. We're watching Graydon Perry. She's doing a site-sized copy drawing of this original Bouguereau painting. you get to a point where when you're doing site size that you don't have to step back all the time, like you could have completed that neck uh, without site size, or will you always make sure that you're double checking it? I double check it, but as I've gotten better, Eric, I have a really a much more um, developed memory for things. So a lot of my work I do uh, from memory uh, so I can look at it and, and get back and forth. Uh, but I always measure and check because I'm always fallible. With that, and I've made some terrible mistakes before. Just, uh, just out of, of, you know, our visual system. I probably needed to eat a, some, you know, protein. <laughs> I'll tell you, if you don't get it right in the in the beginning, you suffer, suffer forever. Uh, this is a monumental time for me because I've never seen you uh, draw. Uh, live, and I certainly have never seen you paint like you're going to do on Realism Live. So that's going to be very cool. I'm looking forward to it. So are How much level of drawing do you need to to put in uh, for what you're going to need for a painting? Will you will you do this to a, a fairly extensive full full fully rendered drawing, or are you just going to try to get the basics in so that you're laying paint on top? Um, somewhere in between. Okay. Uh, 
It's not elaborate. I will sometimes put the shadows in because I need to figure out the shape. And at some, at some point, line is better. At some point, uh, a, a value area is better, uh, especially in the eyes where it's very amorphous. I can't really see what's going on as a linear uh, thing, so I'll kind of mass it in. Okay. Uh, it depends. I, uh, some people like the whole, uh, really approve of that whole um, what I was saying, everything in line, like Jacob Collins' uh, early days, uh, yeah. which is great. And some people uh, prefer a little bit of more of a mass drawing. You can think of Harold Speed uh, mm -hmm. and his painting uh, demonstrations. What year was this particular piece painted, do you know? Uh, around 1880. All right. What age would Bouguereau have been at that time? Well, he was born in 1905, so All right. I mean, he feels okay. enough. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's not. When you look at the Barg book, a lot of the drawing lines are straight, but not all of them. So, in my opinion, it's okay to do slightly curved lines when you are working. But when you're learning, it's probably a good idea to start with straight and then, yes. and then add the curve. Oh, it's to misjudge the peaks on curves, uh, which is okay. It just happens. Don't be afraid of the learning process. Nobody's, nobody comes out a winner in the beginning. Because it's the only way to get there is to be, um, it's to be a little bit um, cavalier about it. But also... Yeah. When you're painting the portraits and so on that you do, or, uh, someone is asking, are you using photographs or are you using live models or both? So, uh, it's according to the age of the person, whether they can sit. I can't paint uh, babe, you know, three-year-olds from uh, life. It just is impossible. They don't sit still for five seconds. But adults, I like to paint from life. I do a lot of studies from life, uh, you know, form studies, um, studies of flowers, studies of those things. So if I ever have to work from a photograph in a portrait, I will use uh, all my life references. All right. I, I'm not really dogmatic about anything, Eric. It's not my, uh, my outlook. Um, I'm more interested in the knowledge than the procedure. I think that that really helps uh, make things look better. It's like you got the basics of the mouth in. We are going for the mouth. Again, I mouth, is, mouth is always a difficult subject. Why is that? Well, because we look at it when people talk to us. <laughs> yeah, when Sargent has said a, a portrait is is something that there's always something wrong about the mouth. Yeah. Uh, it's probably <laughs> true. So, you know, everything when you start with a linear drawing, it's not going to look completely correct until the values are in, uh, but it's a start. Well, I can't emphasize enough the value of, of learning to copy from a master like a Bouguereau yeah. uh, to, to buy a poster or something, even though it's not going to be good as original. You know, eventually you might be able to get into a museum to do a copy. Um, I'm working on getting us the ability to do copies in the Russian museum at the Tretikov gallery in Russia when I go over there in September, but I haven't got that confirmed yet. But, um, uh, I went in there on Monday when it was closed or Tuesday, whatever day it was, and got to watch the students doing copies, which was really fun. Some of them doing very large copies. So this Eric is when I start to just sort of sketch in a little bit of the value. So, uh, it will give me a better idea of the proportion of the face, uh, just a bit. Um, but it's starting to get a general block in of the, the figure. So all of this under here, for example, would be something I would start to model along the sides here, so that I can I can see it. The way I can see, I can start to see the value. And then I'll do a little bit of value from here. You know, the shapes will get more difficult as long as I get the proportion right. 
All right, so I'm getting back and I'm checking my uh, values, making sure that there's the right place here. I'm going to measure the top of the hair. Mine looks a little bit, um, a little bit short, but that could be a value thing. So sometimes it's perception, not reality. It looks it looks wrong. Yeah, it's just because value is makes things look thinner. If you've got a dark value, something will look. Um, uh, too big. So it's that kind of like when you, I always wear black dresses because when I wear white, it makes me look like I'm eating too much. So I, uh, that's the idea. And it really does make a difference with the value. So don't really find that that's too much of a problem. Um, and when I'm drawing, I just make the placement. And again, I'm using, uh, I'm using uh, uh, soft charcoal. To, uh, put that in there. Yeah, it feels to me like the forehead is too too big. It is. I just missed the mark. Ah, it's not right there. But that um, you know that's what happens because you have to put something down to um, to get the idea of it. It's not a problem. I again, I started to enjoy uh, working in oil when I didn't worry about having mistakes. I just learned better and better how to fix them. Right. So it makes it uh, you know just much more delightful to uh, to, uh, to to draw. It's okay, YouTube folks. It's going to cut off in about thirty seconds. So I apologize for you, but you can go back to. Streamline Art video on Facebook and search Streamline Art video and you'll find the continuation of this. How much longer do you think this will be, uh, Graydon? Well, I, it's, I, you know, I'm not going to make a finished drawing here, but I, I'd love to do another 20 minutes. Is that too much? Okay. Yeah, we'll do that. We'll do another 20 minutes. The Pope is waiting. I think I'll get the thing masked in so it looks you know, reasonably correct. the right thing. So I just need to keep looking at the drawing. So right now I am looking at it upside down with my uh, trusty mirror and looking back and forth. And it is just, the portions are pretty good. Um, I just, this is where value is really going to help it look more accurate. So you want to have the, the shading out of the eyes here. And remember that the white of the eyes is, are not white. They're usually out of lower value and somewhat close to neutral with a little bit of flesh tone mixed in, which would be your five yellow red in Munsell terms. We'll talk about that later in the, the painting process, but they need to be, uh, needs to be softened in just a little bit so that it's, it's darker. Those lights will be a little bit better. Bougaro always painted his eyes very soft, didn't, did he not? Yeah, they're very, very soft. Um, his, uh, one of the one of the secrets to his work that I've studied is that everything's very well gradated and blended. So he was very careful about getting those uh, transitional values. Um, If you just tuned in, you're watching uh, Graydon Parrish, our guest today. I'm Eric Rhodes from Fine Art Connoisseur and Plein Air Magazine. And we are live. Graydon is going a little over. We normally are done by now, but we're going to go over another 20 minutes or so uh, to allow him to work on this drawing. He's doing a, a, essentially a drawing that's eventually going to be transferred to a canvas uh, so that he can do a painting of, of a, a, a Bouguereau copy. This is an actual Bouguereau that he's copying and uh, which he's managed to get for us today to be able to view. And um, so this is a treat. Uh, Graydon's going to be a part of Realism Live, uh, which is coming up in October. You can learn more about that at realismlive.com. I feel like a football commentator, you know? Yeah. He's about to grab the ball and he's going to throw the ball. <laughs> I got this Bougaro, so if, the, if you hear uh, 
uh, police sirens, oh, I'm going to take a break and run. Uh, <laughs> Nice to have friends in high places to loan you their bougaros. Uh, sign away my life. So again, I'm I'm using Eric asked about the block in. I kind of like to start to make it look a little more like the lines itself are very difficult to make some something look like a likeness uh, without some kind of tonal tonal values. <laughs> Getting all these emails from people who are watching you and sending you emails. I hope they're commenting on my attractiveness. <laughs> well, the black shirt helps. <laughs> all right, I'm going to check the comments here and see if anybody's got any questions. Ah, somebody said Facebook kicked them off. We might be uh, kicked off in some. Well, we'll just keep going. We'll find out what happens. Somebody likes our funny comments. So Andy is asking, uh, would you paint over this? You'll actually, you're doing it right on the canvas, so you will paint over this. Yes, you won't have to transfer it? Uh, yes, what I'm going to do is once the drawing is good, I'm going to dust it off and then and, and go over the outlines. It's, you know, the value, when I put the values in, it makes, uh, you know, it makes a difference. Everything I tell my students, difference between an average draftsman and an amazing draftsman is about a sixteenth of an inch. Those details really matter between likenesses. And we really have this kind of, of, of uh, problem. It's kind of a narcissism of small differences. You know, we make a big deal out of people who have a little bit of a crooked face versus a perfect one. Um, and, and really, they're more similar than, than different. I'm that guy. I'm, I always get it. You look at the portraits after I've done them live, and they're always a little cattywampus. Yeah, it just happens. But, you know, this will, uh, of course, look more like as I keep going. Well, it says that we're still on YouTube at 63 minutes. Maybe we are we are able to continue there. Maybe I had bad information. So, if you were, uh, are if you were going to transfer to a, another surface, yeah. uh, what would you do? Would you grid this and then draw it, upsize it and draw it? Well, how would you do it? I'll go ahead and ink it in and then trace it and then put oil on the back of the tracing paper. And then go over it and kind of create a um, um, a little bit of a uh, transfer paper that's made of oil. I've used chalk paper for that. It works really beautifully well. Is there a downside to using chalk? That's a great idea. I learned it from um, a student of Ives Gamble who basically taught us we, we would ink it, then we would uh, copy it with a piece of uh, clear acetate uh, and a sh basically a Sharpie. Yeah. And then we'd lay that acetate down over a canvas, put a piece of chalk paper in between, always had, had toned it, and then the chalk paper just laid down on it. worked out very really well. I'm going to switch to some willow charcoal because this one isn't quite soft enough. All right. So I'll get it. Sometimes I made the ground a little smoother than normal. It's not picking up the charcoal as, as much as I'd like to, so I'm going to try this. Again, right. if the materials aren't working, switch to another one. It's not a big yeah. deal. Well, it's also nice to give yourself a, a tiny little break once in a while because, uh, like you, sometimes you need to slip away and get some protein or get a glass of water or do something just to kind of give yourself a mental break. Sure, of course. So, uh, just going to try to uh, yellow charcoal. Okay. I'm sure you get the question somebody's asking if you're any relation to Maxfield Parish. Yeah, only to those people that it matters to. Oh. <laughs> Ha. 
Are you doing a lot of squinting at this point to see the values? I always squint. That's why I need Botox occasionally. Squint, squint, squint. It is really something that is an important uh, thing to do. So I will try to sharpen this a little bit better. The noise you're hearing is cleaning out a pencil sharpener, I'm guessing. Yes, it is. It, uh, <clears throat> it's not. It's not quite it's not too Back to the other one. The, one sh the willow was just not deciding to sharpen very well. All right. So that may be something that is you might have to address with. Um, you know, there's never a, a painting that doesn't go without a little bit of a hitch. Yeah, especially when you're live and there's a um, a bunch of people watching you from all over the world. Oh, I like that. No pressure. Not at all. Yeah. So yeah, this is better. Here. I'm just going to slow down. I actually recommend when you're, you know, this is a demo, but I recommend uh, being okay with being slow and, and deliberate. Um, when I when I slow down and really start to finish something, it. Um, Well, that's something that I learned from you when, when I was studying with you briefly is that I needed to slow down and I had this, you know, my, the nature of my personality is just to get things done. Right, right. And, and that was a very difficult, but important lesson. It is, well, it, yeah, it is for me. Now there are people that are, you know, obviously geniuses and can do it very quickly. But, um, like I said, the more I study, um, painting in the, the 19th century and earlier days, they were, they were just very deliberate. They said, you know, I need that value there, and they weren't trying to think it was a magical uh, formula for it, which is, uh, is nice. But again, I, um, when I started to like say, well, yeah, I have this other thing I put up in all my students' studios. I say everything is fixable so they, they don't panic. There's a nice thing about oil painting and charcoal is that you can move it around a little bit and correct yourself. Right. And so the idea about the difference between a painter at a high level and one at a low level is just that they know how to fix their problems. I had an opportunity to see that Bouguereau sh show in um, in Memphis last September. Oh, really? And uh, so I was driving home from here, and I stopped and saw it, and then I think it went from there to San Diego. It was phenomenal. So again, if you just tuned in, because we are seeing some audience increase, um, uh, this is Graydon Parrish, who is doing a copy of a Bouguereau. He's drawing, doing a drawing for um, a painting that he's going to do on Realism Live, which is coming up in October. So he's uh, trying to do a site size drawing. He's putting in a shading right now. Uh, this is designed to, to essentially give him a, a roadmap so that he can do his painting later. He's doing it on a uh, canvas, which is made out of polyester. And lots of little polyesters died for this. Yes, they did. Um, yeah. They're endangered in certain, uh, certain cities. Thankfully, they're not as endangered as they once were because double knit is not quite as in fashion as it once was in the 70s. Yeah, yeah. They, they kind of, they kind of, that was a low point. They got this, there were polyester, um, uh, people who conserved them. Which yes. Good. Thankfully, you're not painting a naga hide. No. Or fine Corinthian leather.
Really oh. not very much of that painting is in light. Now that you've got that in, you can really see. Yes. I've got a, a spotlight on it. I found a better pencil sharpener too, uh, that I was elusive and decided because we're doing the, the, the work of the universe here, I can now sharpen my charcoals. Ah. So I'm just toning some of this down a little bit so it starts to model. I might not be able to go as dark as I need to in the eyes. There's a big accent there. Here, this seems to be refined a little bit. Now, you guys are having Rose Franson on. We are. And she's a marvel. And she just starts with a very loose, loose interpretation. But again, she's an example of somebody who knows how to fix uh, all her problems. Not that they're problems, but she can start off looking like, you know, Jackson Pollock, and by the end, it's looking like a beautiful portrait. She pulls it all together. Yeah, I admire that. I'd like her to be my best friend. Oh, you have, she probably is. <laughs> you know, uh, I was talking to um, Tim Reese the other day. Tim Reese was on uh, on one of the broadcasts, and he just moved to her small town in, in Iowa, and um, he he bought a house I can't say the amounts of money because it wouldn't be appropriate, but I was amazed at, at the low amount of money for how big a house he got in that town. I thought this will become an artist community fast because everybody can go there and buy a building and buy a house and not spend any money. I'll tell you, the um, Eric, uh, the biggest bargain right now in Texas is Brownsville and McAllen. They are pennies on the dollar and you get a tropical location and a, a bilingual culture. And I'm hoping people will move down there at least for a, a winter, um, you know, at least for a winter um, a getaway. Because it's, you know, it's it, the lowest it gets in the winter is about as high as 71. And it's a, a lot more, um, um, you can grow things that you can't quite grow in Austin. Right? Is this a clue to what you're going to be doing? Well, I bought it. We bought a house down there, so um, ah. I, I just am shocked at the, um, the the affordability of it. And there's like three airports, so the idea of traveling. And now we have internet access, and so like you, we were talking about, um, it's probably going to change the way that art, the art world functions. So you don't need to be in New York uh, as much as you can just be online. Well, you and I always talked about creating an artist colony in Austin because it was the center of of Texas, the center, you know, wasn't as expensive as New York and Los Angeles. And, um, and we talked about starting an atelier. And of course now one has been started by someone else, which is doing a really great job. And, um, we're seeing a lot of people moving to Austin, although Austin's becoming more expensive now, uh, because so many people are moving in. Yeah. My, what they're doing in my neighborhood, it's very San Francisco. They're tearing down all the houses and building new ones. Oh, that's too bad. I don't think I could ever uh, live here. No. But it is, it's a very vibrant city. There's certainly everybody likes it. Yeah. And Josh the Rock lives here. And he's Not a for long. He also loves Bugaro, so he, yeah. he's a good one to uh, talk to about. Josh is, Josh is moving to uh, to Maine. Oh, he is? Yep. Oh, wow. Yep, just learned that this week. He's Did just, he uh, find a, uh, does he have relatives up there? Yeah, it's, you know, it's a tug of family. I see. Got young kids, you need support systems. Sure. But we'll, we'll quickly find a replacement for Josh. <laughs> <We'll move down. laughs> so I'm using tone here, uh, value to just, you know, correct the drawing. It, it's very hard for get a likeness without With us. So as I'm doing this, it's getting more and more like what I was seeing. Here we go. That's better. He is really. Uh, you have a wonderful lineup at Realism. Um, again, I'm working on this. I can't. 
I hope Eric, I can watch some of the videos too. So, oh, of course. Yeah, this is good. Your faculty, you get all access. You're you're on live the whole time. Can I get a faculty buffet too? A, fa a faculty what? A buffet, a faculty buffet room. Uh, yeah, sure. I'm kidding. Uh, we're not going to be in live. <laughs> Well, this is fun. I'm, I'm glad we had the time to be able to take this a little further today. Yeah, I think it's looking better. You know, I, I think that the copy here is not too bad for uh, the beginning of, of the painting. Now, I'm going to keep refining it a little bit. It's a bit distorted because of the camera angle. But I'm going to be working on it, and I will have it ready to start for the Realism Live. And I'm working from, we're doing, um, after this, I'm going to uh, paint in the lines solidly. Like, Bugar would use an ink. Again, in my homage to Virgil Elliott, I'm going to use oil paint uh, or George O'Hanion. And, um, and I'm going to block into that, get the drawing better, and then I will paint on top of this. I probably won't transfer it to another canvas, although I might. If I, the only thing I don't like about this is a little bit of spottiness. You wouldn't see that in Bouguereau. Again, most of his canvases were, these study canvases were prepared uh, by a, uh, the art store. So they, this was a standard portrait size. They had standard landscape size. And you could get them in a variety of colors and, and uh, grounds from absorbent yeah. to uh, non-absorbent. Well, why don't we do this, Graydon? Uh, we'll, we'll wrap up now. But if you will, uh, when you finish the drawing at whatever point, find this broadcast and post it in the comments so people can see the drawing. Do I have any questions that I need to, to follow up with? I'm sorry? Do we have time for a question from somebody on the internet? Uh, yeah, sure. We, of course we do. Uh, if we have any questions, let me see here. It takes, takes some, uh, what type of ink would you normally use? India ink? I know you're going to use oil in this case, but what, what uh, type of yeah, ink? Indian, that's what Bugro would use, uh, India ink. I don't do it. I just, you know, there's, I, I try as much as I love Bouguereau, I try to listen to the conservators today and not be stubborn. Well, so, I also hate to ruin a drawing. Yeah. It's a beautiful drawing. Thank you. Well, it, it, uh, it needs a little, uh, certainly a little bit more of the, the value. Um, the, the charcoal here isn't, isn't, um, really, uh, is, is easily to do on this smooth canvas. This is one of the first times I've used this. It's gonna behave a little bit more with texture as far as the drawing, but again, we're really not doing a drawing, we're doing a painting. So these are a, a step towards that goal. Right. So when you, when, you, uh, when you drop off and you get away from it and then you come back, you'll remeasure and see if your drawing is a little off and you'll correct it. And then uh, once you transfer it, you're, gonna, uh, you're going to uh, do what? You're gonna put a piece of paper over it Oh, if you if you were to transfer it, how would you transfer it again? Well, I think I might try that acetate uh, uh, thing. So I'm going to just see how that works. I don't use that; like I usually use tracing paper. But yeah, uh, if you go to if you go to Jerry's there in town, they have what they call chalk paper. There, okay. it's in rolls like Saran wrap, and uh, and then try the acetate, and then you just take a uh, I take a stylus or something, mm -hmm. just so it creates a little bit of pressure. And uh, works pretty well. I have an axe in my studio. Do you think it'll work? Yeah, I think it'll work. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Why do you have an axe in your studio? A what? What? You uh -huh. said you have an axe. Why do you have an axe? <laughs> that, it, it goes back to the the bodies in the studio. I get that now. You know, if you don't chop them up the right way, they mix <laughs> into the pigments. Um, <laughs> all right. What else? Uh, okay, just see if there's any other questions in here. Lots of positive uh, feedback. Uh, is it possible to have a close-up of the original uh, so that I have a drawing ready for Realism Live? Because uh, uh, what she's going to do is copy while you're painting. Okay, so what I'm, I'm going to do is when I get the other photo things photographed, I'll get this photographed as well, and then I'll get a copy for the for people. All right, terrific. Yeah, okay. Right. Well, how about a round of applause? Everyone thumbs up for Graydon Parrish. Uh, Graydon, this is exciting. I, uh, I will see you uh, in the studio. I'll be flying back literally the night before. Okay. Uh, so um, I will have been on an airplane. You might want to wear a mask. I'm just saying. I, I 
will. I wear masks all the time. <laughs> uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Really uh, sign up for Real Live. It's going to be spectacular. And I'm going to keep working on this Bougaro today and get a little bit more refined for you guys later. But it's just a matter of time on task. It just happens with everybody. Remember, Bougaro was a fabulous artist, but he did have assistants doing a lot of work for him. So those big, prolific artists tend to have uh, a lot of help. Do you think Bougaro had people drawing uh, heads and hands for him? They, there is evidence of that, yes, but they also did the background very often, and they would do the, uh, sometimes would do the clothing. You know, they did all kinds of stuff for him. He was mysterious, but there's evidence uh, and notes from people like Damien Bartoli had brought a lot of that to light. And, and are all of those notes now in the catalog resume that uh, Fred Ross did? I'm not 100% sure. Um, I have an archive. I make copies of a lot of those things with Jerry. So I have some some of it, not nearly what Fred has and Damien, but I still have some of that. It, it's interesting. You know, there is, you know, the artists in the past were you and me. So they did a lot of the things that we are doing and they just got better and better at at the, at the uh, craft. Yeah. But they had one, a question, one question here is why not just use calipers to measure side to side instead of stepping back and doing side size? You can. Um, I like to train my eye. Yeah. Okay. Um, I do right. a lot of, of you know, try to keep getting better at it. So I, I tend to appreciate just going for it and adjusting. That's all right. Yeah, if you don't, if you're not getting something right, by all means, go and check it. Yep. There's a hello to you from Avril in South Australia. First time I've ever heard your voice. Well, I hope she can understand me. I don't speak Australian, so. <laughs> All right. looks like that's all the questions we've got for now, but I'm sure there will be more. Um, you might want to, once you're done, go into the comments uh, tonight sometime. Okay. Uh, there will be, by the time of the different platforms, there will be four or 5,000 views between Instagram and Facebook and, and others. And so thank you, Graydon Parrish, for doing this today. Uh, thank uh, you. We really so appreciate much. you taking the extra time so we could, we could see this develop. Well, I enjoyed it. And uh, I really did enjoy it and connecting with everybody. And, and thank you, Eric, for, for promoting uh, classical and realism, realist contemporary art today. We really oh, absolutely. It's my passion.